top of the morning to you. Welcome to Shattering Myths, a program devoted to the fastest growing segment of our society. To those of you who have come to realize, or at least open to the realization, that all of the world's religious, political, economic, and military institutions are corrupt, that they are actually counterproductive, working against your interests. I am Yada. Our number, if you'd like to join us any time over the next two hours, is toll-free, 877-376-45. We invite your participation. The United States uh, said that this article reads, yeah, I didn't know that an inanimate object could speak. But nonetheless, uh, the United States said, uh, according to the um, Reuters News Service, I mean, does that mean that that if you're an appointed official of the U.S. government that you speak for the country. And if so, I know these guys aren't speaking for me. So my guess is they're not speaking for you, Scott. My guess is they're not speaking for the majority of Americans. So why is it that when one of the many buffoons, both elected to and appointed by Americans and by their politicians, speaks. It's the United States said. You know, it's like saying a rock said. My orchard told me. Anyway, the United States said on Tuesday that it was very disturbed by anti-U.S. hostility voiced by Iran's top leader after a nuclear deal as both countries' top diplomats sought to calm Opposition to the accord from political hardliners at home. So, if you're a um, opposed to the Iranian nuclear deal, you're a hardliner, according to the idiot that wrote this piece for Reuters. Because this idiot that wrote this piece for Reuters is incapable of seeing a world apart from political correctness and media liberalism. And therefore, his Democrat is always right, always forming accords with other nations is always right, no matter how flawed those accords are. And so the opposition, which would be those dastardly Republicans who are Neanderthals, according to this writers, they're the hardliners in both countries. You know, if this uh, writer for uh, Reuters had the will to investigate and the capacity to exercise good judgment, he would recognize that uh, among the leaders in Iran, and that would include everyone from the top leader, the Ayatollah Khamenei, to the prime minister, to all of the government officials, to all of the military officials, that 100% of those who are in power in Iran are fundamentalists. They are the definition of extreme or hard line in terms of their adherence to fundamentalist Shiite Islam. In a theocracy ruled by the supreme ayatollah, there is no option, there is no possibility of anyone coming to power that isn't a fundamentalist, hard-in-line Shiite Muslim. And this notion that their prime minister is somehow a moderate because he um, was part of the negotiations with the International uh, Atomic Energy Commission that somehow that this uh, individual is, um, is uh, moderate because he has used negotiations, this is Rouhani, uh, to further the Iranian objection, objectives which were stated by the Grand Ayatollah yesterday is just to be completely ignorant of his past. And I've shared this on this program before, but it bears repeating. That President Hassan Rouhani was the top aide to the Ayatollah Khomeini. 
He was instrumental in the return of Khomeini to Iran and to the establishment of the Iranian theocracy that is, exists now in Tehran and throughout Iran. And as a reward for that, he was given charge of the Iranian military, and he uh, shepherded the Iranian military as a hardliner against Sunni Islam during the Iran-Iraq wars. You could not have a history or a biography or a resume that would be more hardline. He has authored a score of books on Shiite Islam. He's a cleric, for crying out loud. I mean, this notion, because he is uh, educated and speaks and writes well and dresses well, that he is somehow not a hardliner because he's not in robes, says that the person making that determination is wholly ignorant or wishes to be unaware, ignorant of their of Rouhani's past. But the thing that we don't seem to understand as Americans, and particularly our politicians, is that Islam is incompatible with every value Americans hold dear. It's incompatible with representative government. The Quran is wholly incompatible with free will, with volition. It's incompatible with freedom of religion. It's incompatible with free speech. All of the things that Americans would hold dear that it considers to be constitutional rights are disallowed in Islam because of the Quran. And so, as Muslims view the world, America as an advocate for freedom, for free speech, for freedom of religion, for representative government, for a civil judicial system, or at least the pretense of one, is in every way in conflict with the Islamic view of the world. Their view is the antithesis of that held by the West, held by Americans. And so when we negotiate a deal on atomic bombs with the uh, Iranians, and we expect the Iranians to view America favorably because it played the leading role in lifting the sanctions from Iran, giving it extraordinarily favorable terms under this agreement, and we expect that we have reset, as journalists did, lauding the Obaminator's great political triumph, that we've reset the relationships with Iran and gone from it being part of the axis of evil, as it was described by Bush, or the great Satan, as they referred to the United States. It is naive. As the Grand Ayatollah Khamenei, made his first speech post-nuclear uh, deal. The chance in the background that he encouraged, the, the overwhelming punctuation to his speech, the only repetitive phrases were these two. Death to America, death to Israel. Death to America, death to Israel. What do you think the odds are that Iran's nuclear program was for the peaceful generation of electricity when the will of the people, when the intent of the leaders is death to America and death to Israel? Point zero 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 one, I, I guess. <laughs> Oh, that's you're optimistic today. You got up on you got today. up on your optimistic side of the bed today. I don't like to say there's no chance for for things, but no chance. Uh, <laughs> you mean a snowball's chance in hell? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so here's the uh, here's the deal. The United States said on Tuesday that it was very disturbed by anti-U.S. hostility voiced by Iran's top uh, leader after a nuclear deal, as both countries' top diplomats sought 
to calm opposition to the accord from political hardliners at, at home. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry said uh, a speech by Iranian Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei on Saturday vowing to defy American policies in the region despite a deal with world powers over Tehran's nuclear program was very troubling. What does he expect? What did he expect? I mean, Islam is Islam. It has always been Islam. It always responds the same way. If you read the goddamn Quran, you would understand the Muslim mindset. Why don't our diplomats read the goddamn Quran, and I mean, it, mean that literally, the goddamn Quran, the God-forsaken Quran, and come to understand the mindset of those they're negotiating with. You know why this should be very troubling? Is that the billions of dollars, and it's tens of billions, maybe hundreds of billions, of dollars of weaponry that we have supplied to Iraq, Guess who is uh, in complete control of that weaponry? Iran. The leader of, uh, of Iraq is a, um, an Iranian diplomat. The leader of uh, Iraq was chosen because the imams in Iraq, including the Grand Ayatollah uh, Al Sustaini, who is the, the who is an Iranian mullah, directly related to and uh, in um, all manner to Khamenei, dictated who his fellow Shiite Muslims ought to vote for, and the line was pretty simple: you either vote for this slate of candidates which are wholly beholden to Shiite Islam and to us, or Allah will burn your britches in hell. And so that's what they got, was a Shiite government in America, unable to figure out that would be the result, supplied a, an entire new army with all new spiffy uniforms and weapons to this new Shiite government under the false pretense that it would be a unified Iraq, not really as that Iran and Iraq, Shia and Sunni Islam have been at war for centuries. Once from the leader of American foreign policy, the very individual who negotiated this capitulation to Iran. And I'm certain, when, because he knows it was a capitulation to Iran, gave Iran everything they wanted, that, that he was so naive that he viewed his capitulation to Iran as something the Iranians would celebrate, and, and to a large degree they did. Uh, and so they're celebrating the fact that America surrendered to, to Iran, but they um, um, are not, they don't understand why when you give a foe uh, everything they want, when you capitulate to a foe, why is it that that foe hates you all the more? And it's the lesson that the West never learned from Neville Chamberlain. Neville Chamberlain wanted to satiate the, the land conquest desires of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party, which is extraordinarily similar to Islam and to the uh, Khomeini, uh, by giving them what they claimed they wanted, which was the high ground of Czechoslovakia, which had a predominant number, percentage anyway, of German nationals. And so when he gave them what was not his to give, the high ground of Czechoslovakia, uh, he expected that Germany would then view England favorably, because it was total capitulation. Well, Kerry made exactly the same mistake. He thought that what he was doing would cause the Iranians to reset their relationships with the United States, view the United States as an enabler and favorably. But what did Hitler do after the capitulation of Czechoslovakia? He simply started World War II. So what do you think the Iranians are going to do after the capitulation on the nuclear deal? They're going to start World War III. And 
their rhetoric towards the United States actually became harsher. Glenn, we don't have very smart people leading uh, uh, American foreign policy. Uh, yada, yada. You, you think that we can achieve peace through submission, but yes, we can, and it's time for change. And I think through Obama, we will see peace in our time if we only just concede and concede and concede. <laughs> it will work. The, um, yes? I'll tell you, lately, I, you know, I've long uh, argued with uh, my acquaintances about the apathy of Americans being, you know, a problem. And, you know, they, mm -hmm. the Americans are into their lifestyle. They're busy with, you know, whatever they're busy with. And, and they're standing there, well, I, we can't, I can't do anything anyway, so there's no use, you know, troubling myself with that. And I've always said, no, no, wait a minute, hold on now. If everybody paid attention, you know, if the cat's away, the mice will play. We the people are the cat. Well, if the cat's away, the mice and rodents in, in D.C. and elsewhere will mm -hmm. play. And, um, and you know, but in a way, I, I myself am growing I mean, I'm just at a time right now, low, where I'm weary of this. I've been listening to this stuff, you know, yeah. for years and processing it. And I'm at the moment, I'm somewhat empathetic to the people who say, "What's the use?" Yeah, but, what's the use? Yeah. Yeah, but but I um. Let me ask you a question, yeah, Glenn. I, 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 I am tired. Of, just one second. I am really. I am, of course, tired of all the, the you know Islamic stuff and everything. But I am far more tired mm -hmm. of the lies of American politicians and media. Yeah. yeah. Let, me, let me ask you. Let me ask you a couple of questions now. First of all, mm -hmm. um, do you think it is likely that the Islamic stuff that is being perpetrated by Iran and the uh, Islamic State at all, Boko Haram, is going to be contained within the borders of Syria, uh, Iraq, and Nigeria, or is that Islamic stuff ultimately going to uh, wreak havoc with? Uh, the West, uh, Europe, and the United States. Okay. I am no genius. I am no scholar, but I am rudimentarily literate. And mm -hmm. I can read both the Quran and Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the answer is I'm unqualified. No. That, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that uh, you're right. It's not going to be contained to those countries. So that Islamic stuff is going to have a profound and negative effect on, uh, on America. Now, you and I agree that there is no way that, based on the nature of Islam and based on the prophecies that uh, we uh, hold to be true, because God's had an amazing track record on his prophecies, uh, that there is nothing we can do to foreclose on these travesties. But we, I think, also agree that by warning people about the human failures, the governmental failures, the military failures, the diplomatic failures that have enabled this onslaught of terror, that we're helping people recognize they shouldn't depend on these solutions. Welcome back to Shattering Mist. So, uh, Glenn, while you're weary of listening to this Islam stuff, and, you know, I got weary speaking about Islam about... Um, 12 years ago, um, since there are so few people willing to tell the truth about Islam and to report on it accurately, recognizing that it is the most deadly, damning, the deceitful, destructive influence in our world today, I think we, uh, we owe it. I think it's our, owe it to people. I think it's our responsibility. I think it's important that we, uh, we continue to talk about it. Um, I think these things are important for people to know. And um, well, yeah, well, they, yeah, they, absolutely. Well, the thing is, well, yeah, what's so wearisome is the, the never-ending flow of lies. I just listened to Lindsey Graham completely misrepresent and lie about what's been said by Donald Trump lately. Yes. And, and yeah. um, I mean, just lie, just abjectly lie, and put words right. in people's right. mouths. You know. Right. Right. And, and I think away from some noise right. here, just right. and, yeah. and it's just like I, and I guess I know Tom has maroon and Kia as its justification for its lies, and everybody has yeah. their own 
the West has a slightly different, you know, ends justifies the means Machiavellian, mm-hmm. you know, Hegelian dialectic thing going right. on. But so I'm just weary of uh, this constant litany and its never ending lies is really wearisome. Yes. And, and here's the thing I, I don't understand the media being so hell bent on um, denying what is so obvious about, I mean, this, when the shooter, you know, uh, says things that are specifically Islamic and jihad oriented, and they turn around and try and paint him as, you know, as a, um, a depressed out of work, uh, yeah, uh, yeah mental case. Redneck yeah. loser. Yeah. Redneck yeah. loser. And it, it, yeah. And it's just crazy. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's I what they're doing right now. Was, they're, they're presenting him as a redneck loser. And, and here's the ironic thing. For those who hold that, um, the American media is so controlled by Zionist Jews and Israel, could somebody yeah. please explain to me why, why the Zionist Jews controlling the media are hell bent on promoting Islam so much? Oh, yeah, really. Yeah. There is no one controlling the media. The media is self-controlling. And the way, what I mean by that is that you cannot get or hold any meaningful position in the media without being politically correct. And that's even right. true of the, those who uh, claim to present a conservative point of view with, uh, like Fox. And there is no way anyone in the media, because you cannot obtain or hold any meaningful job without being politically correct, is ever going to tell the truth about any one of the major issues of our day, including Islam. It is never going to happen. But what what both of us would hope, and we're, we will not be disappointed when it does not happen, is that there is a difference between being unwilling to hold Islam accountable for the hellish behaviors perpetrated by fundamentalist Muslims in the name of Islam. That's, that's sad. That shows we have no sense of morality or good judgment. It's another thing entirely to consistently seek to exonerate Islam, to lie on behalf of the religion, and to present the religion as a non-factor in these the terrorist attacks. And that's what's happening in the media. So it's it's you know it's it's bad to not hold the perpetrator responsible, but it is a whole cr- a crime of an entirely different caliber to uh, be an ally of the criminal. And when folks like the Abominator and those in the FBI and those in the media seek to exonerate Islam from these attacks, then in fact they uh, they are aliases. They're uh, accomplices in the terrorist acts perpetrated by the religion. So, so in terms of your emphasis on using words rather than uh, weapons, and mm-hmm. um, and then of course not wanting to be a chamberlain. Um, so your emphasis would be to is simply to you know tell the truth and expose yeah. the actual. Yeah, in fact, that was the uh, actual question uh, I was going to ask you. I was going to say, is there a difference between? Because you began by saying, you know, that we should simply uh, submit and, and surrender to uh, to these people. Capitulation is the uh, order of the day. Is there a is there a way um, to avoid surrender without fighting? Most people think that you have to lash back, uh, and if you don't lash back, you're submitting to a uh, a foe. Is there an alternative? to avoid surrendering or submitting to a, a adversary, uh, then responding aggressively, uh, fire with fire, military with military, war with war. Well, yeah, yeah, the, you know, effective refutation, theoretically, if you're, going to, if you're going to have access to a means to make a message known and then, you know, mm-hmm. so, you know making your mm-hmm. allegations for your statements and reputation clear and substantiated with references yeah. and stuff, yeah, that, yes. that should theoretically work. However, like, yeah. the media just doesn't do, cannot be made to do uh, that. Yeah, okay. Let me speak to that. Let me speak to that. Um, so your conclusion here is identical with my own, that, uh, that when someone attacks you in a terrorist fashion, you don't have to respond uh, as a terrorist and bomb civilians. 
when somebody uh, attacks you militarily, you don't have to respond militarily to avoid uh, this idea of surrender or submission. There is another approach, and that approach is, uh, is no less likely to prevail, which is that expose and condemn the opposing uh, party. Use words to correctly assess not only the cause and the perpetrator of the heinous behavior, of the violent behavior, but also articulate a plan that maximizes the likelihood that the perpetrator will fail in their goals. And for example, let me give you a good example. Uh, when the Muslims uh, from Saudi Arabia, uh, in principle, um, perpetrated 9-11, what I, uh, I came up with a three-part plan. And the three-part plan began with putting the, uh, the, uh, pinning the tail on the donkey, exposing the fact that Islam was solely responsible for these terrorist attacks and that Islam is a call to uh, war. It's a uh, terrorist manifesto. It's a criminal enterprise all masquerading as a religion. And to expose and condemn the perpetrator of the attacks by articulating the, the, actual, the accurate uh, nature of the Islamic religion, quoting their scriptures. That would be the first thing, to hold the religion responsible so that you know who your enemy is. The, uh, the second part of that uh, plan was to, was to put together a, a plan that would make it nigh on impossible for Muslims to attack and kill uh, Americans again. And the answer there was to cease buying oil from them, to immediately stop buying oil from any Islamic country and stop selling weapons to Islamic countries, and to disengage economically from Islamic countries, isolating them. And if you did that, it would be impossible for Muslims to uh, export terror. And matter of fact, if you effectively condemned the religion such that it would be illegal to have a mosque or to be a practicing Muslim here because the religion is so illegal in, in every respect, it is illegal, um, unconstitutional, that you preclude its practice here, it would be impossible for Muslims to perpetrate acts of terror of any magnitude in this country. I mean, that's a, that's a plan. Now, if I had a third aspect of the plan, which you and I would, uh, would see as the most beneficial, uh, but um, others uh, would, uh, would discount it, which is that we need to, as a nation, open our minds, open our eyes, open our ears, and come to know who Yahweh is, tell the truth about him, so that we begin to uh, discredit religions and politics as a whole and come to know God as he is, so that more people can exercise good judgment. Regarding yeah, that's, that's, but that's definitely not going to happen. Yeah. So that, that, those, that's a plan that has no violence involved, that completely thwarts the threat of Islamic terrorism, and that, uh, that uh, heals the nation and the souls of its people. Using words. That's the kind of thing that I think uh, has the highest likelihood of success when uh, implemented. Vastly more success than invading Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, Pakistan, and Libya. It's, uh, the thing is, uh, the reason nothing like that can ever happen is because the people in the halls of power I don't think there's, we have anybody really at the, in any branch of government at this point that really cares, is really trying to maintain America as we might understand it as a, you know, constitutional republic. Okay. Uh, well, let me, you let me ask you this. Yeah. Let me ask you this thing, Glenn. The realization, and we agree on this too, the realization that there is no chance whatsoever that any one of those three um, parts of the plan that would absolutely work. I mean, it's, uh, I don't think you would disagree that, that if implemented, the plan would work. Uh, but we recognize that n not one of those three pillars of that plan will be implemented. But the fact that they will not be implemented, is, is that reason not to talk about it? 
Should we not propose it just because uh, uh, it's not going to be chosen? No, no, but um, uh, it, 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 uh, it, it does get wearisome. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm thinking of times when the OSHA led disciples away to come away from the crowds and the, and the take a rest, you know. That, oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, I took a, uh, I took a year off uh, in doing this. Uh, you know, I've been doing it now for 15 years. I took a year off. Uh, because it just got worrisome. And, uh, you know, it, there was a period of time in my life, uh, Glenn, where I was doing five hours of talk radio a day, um, but where, where I was saying yes at other people's shows. So my schedule was completely screwed up. And I had to be at a place, a quiet place, with a, uh, a phone and on schedule to receive the phone call five different times a day from, uh, you know, nationally syndicated talk radio hosts. And, uh, and there became a time where it really became wearisome and uh, I remember it, that during that period I said you know yeah I need a break I mean I just really need a break I'm tired of talking about this stuff I know there's no one else to do it but I'm tired of talking about it and I took a break and uh, there was a period of time where I had somebody that was really critical of questioning Paul and um, I, uh, I took a break welcome back to Shattering Mist we're talking about really one of the most important um I think issues of our day. Uh, we may have uh, stumbled into it by uh, Glenn being facetious in the beginning by saying, no, 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 you just don't understand. We ought to be capitulating to our enemies. And, and if we just all uh, surrendered, there would be peace. But uh, it did bring us to um, this opportunity to discuss a very different approach. Uh, and it's an approach that that, uh, Glenn, it, we know that it's an approach that's not going to be accepted by our country or any country at large. But since the approach is reasonable, since the approach would absolutely work, and since those advocating the approach are doing, are advocating something that is conveyed and accepted exactly the same way, and it happens to be Yahweh's covenant. I um, am energized every time I have the opportunity to do this program. Right. Um, Tim, bearing in mind, we're often fed, we're fed all these hero movies where the goal is to save the world, save the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Yahweh's Yow not saving the world. No. You know, so it takes a big part of the burden off. You know, no. it's like right. he's saving those who respond to him and come right. to him and right. leave. The world and and, right. and and covenant with him. One so. one soul at a time, and you know, every week, sometimes multiple times a week, I get an email from someone who has um, either been directed to this program or to the books or to uh, or has somehow you know stumbled on it, and they uh, they write and talk about their journey out of either agnosticism or uh, religion and how. They've come to know God as he really is and the great joy of, uh, of being, you know, just playing a role and, uh, and helping people out of the darkness into the light. Uh, it's all of the, the thrill, all of the satisfaction that one could ever want in life. So you're right. It's, uh, there is nothing we're talking about that is going to prevail on a national level, and we don't expect it to. Right. But individual souls, when they hear a message that resonates, that is logical, that's informed, then they're drawn to, well, since that makes sense, what else do they have to say? And when what else they have to say is a summation of what, Yahweh had to say, and he just happens to be God, and particularly what he had to say about his covenant, then uh, individuals can uh, be far more than saved. They can engage in a personal and familiar relationship with the creator of the universe. It's worth doing. Yeah, and that's, that's a, a load off the mind as well, you know. Yeah. Um, the... Um uh, actually, I should probably go here. Um, yeah. Let me just swing back to the beginning where you said that you're worrisome of Islam. 
You know, one of the things that I found about uh, about talking about and writing about Islam, and I, you know, second maybe to IQ al I think I know the religion better than anyone uh, alive today, is that there has been a great benefit, Glenn, of being able to speak honestly and openly about Islam and predict everything that Muslims would do and have done over these past 15 years, is that it has been the catalyst to draw people to the message of Yahweh. And without right. that, there, there would not have been this, uh, this opportunity. Because so many people read those books and said, you know, this makes sense. This is a logical and informed presentation of the nature of this evil that is so terrorizing the world. And they turned to, well, what else did he have to say? And what else he had to say was to convey what Yahweh had to say in that same informed and rational way. And it's resonated with thousands of people around the world. Oh, yeah, and, well, especially, like, in the face of such, you know, the barbarism and the lies and stuff like that, you know. Yes. And then you look around, and then you'll have different people react different ways to look for other ideologies or religions. And there's, you know what, there's only one way, and there's no horizontal, you know, solution. There's only way out is, out is up. Right. <laughs> you know, you know, right. Like, to go get above the fray. Yeah, all the, the yeah, all the horizontal solutions. Yeah, all the horizontal solutions are human institutions. And yeah, I was saying, no, 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 we're, we're not going that way. We're going this way. And this way is up. Oh, yeah. And it's up to the stars. It's up, up in dimensions. Yeah. And it's extraordinarily fast and it's extraordinarily enlightening and extraordinarily wonderful. Extraordinarily different than the world we're talking about now.